The host needs to put up my video. Okay, okay. Yes. All right, then. I will get someone to help with that because for some reason I don't know how to do that. Okay. Okay. Welcome to this conversation. It's going to be good. Um, we're carrying on that theme of um, opportunities. How can we harness and explore the different opportunities there are in the sports industry? We've been looking perhaps at the sports industry from a very narrow uh, lens. And the whole purpose of this sports summit is to expand your perspective, increase your view. Let's, let's, let's look at it broadly. Sports is an industry that encompasses so many different facets, training, coaching, manufacturing, broadcasting, media, apparel, products, glitz and glam, you name it. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for hanging in there with us on this journey. Um, I'm glad, Moeng Olua, you're finding it insightful because we don't get enough of these kind of conversations. Sports is almost deprived. So the whole idea of OAL was to partner with stakeholders in the industry to have these very stimulating conversations. I'm going to allow both of you begin by introducing yourselves. I'm going to bring up Ade Dami as well to this conversation. Here we go, Adedami, I'm bringing you up. Shayo, please introduce yourself. Don't worry, I'll get the video on. I'll find the right person to bring the videos on. So just uh, let's carry on in the meantime. Okay. Um, thank you, Beverly. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, a pleasure being here. Thank you. Um, yesterday was amazing, by the way, um, the you. cocktail. <laughs> and thanks for my plaque. Um, it's, it's, it's sitting right here in front of me. No, once the video comes on, you can share it. Yes, I can show it. Yeah, it's sitting right here in front of me to remind me to give my best because I've been rewarded before even speaking. Um, all the same, uh, it's a pleasure being here. My name is Shai Olabi. Um, I am the co-founder CEO for the Lagos Esports Forum. And um, even though it bears the name Lagos, it's in no way a government organization. It's a totally private organization founded, um, interestingly, two years ago, May, during the lockdown. And um, it was just an opportunity for myself and a couple of like minds to come together to look for all the opportunities, just as we're talking about on this panel, um, when sports was totally knocked off by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And in the last um, Two years, we've been able to have our imprints across Africa and also on the international scene, where um, at the moment I sit on two commissions at the Global Esports Federation, the Education, Culture and Youth, and the International Relations and Development Commission. And I also was appointed in September 2021 as the Accolade. Secretary General. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as the Secretary General of the Africa Esports Development Federation. That's um, a body set up by the Global Esports Federation to lead the growth and development of esports on the African continent. And I'm excited to say that we have six countries that would be part of the Commonwealth Esports Championships from Africa. And um, we're making sure that um, they have good representation there, including Nigeria, uh, by the way. And we're making sure they have good representation there. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. Oh, it's so glad. I'm, it, I, I'm happy to have you. I mean, so many amazing things you've done in just two years. So there's no excuse, honestly. Let me introduce Noka Aguda. Please, please introduce <laughs> yourself and the organization you represent. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, thank you to Bev and OAL team. This is an amazing summit, well done. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ajona Kaguda and um, what I do in sports is basically legal and business commercial affairs. I currently head legal and women's sports at Integral, which is basically a full service sports management company. And so I'm involved across the sports business value chain so from sponsorships to events and activations to media rights, um, to athlete management and then to hospitality. And so what we do is really just sort of plug into, as you're saying, opportunities. We sort of um, look for ways to create opportunities for um, both brands and sports properties in Nigeria and sort of like to bridge a gap between um, the African market, so to say and then the global sports space as well. So thank you all for having me look forward to this amazing session. Thank you, Ajunoka and Ade Dami, welcome. 
Good to uh, see th you. Thanks, Beverly. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I listened to um, the session before this one, and it was quite um, educative. Um, so first, I want to thank you for putting this together and giving us the opportunity to share knowledge. So also, you know, more importantly, um, gain knowledge and you know have this um, conversation. Uh, my name is Ali Dami Ali Dotsno. Um, I'm a big advocate of the commercialization of professional sports in Nigeria. Um, I work with the Temple Company as the head of sports. And what we do at Temple is um, summarily to um, deliver value and help all our stakeholders achieve their objectives. And we do that with a sprinkle of excellence because we believe that um, at Temple, whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. Um, a recent engagement was um, helping University of Lagos deliver the best local games ever. And those are the kind of things we want to do. We want to um, bring excellence into sports industry. Um, we want to help harness the opportunities that we know and that we strongly believe exist in the industry. And, um, and that's, that is what, that is what we do. That is what I do. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. I mean, this is like a fantastic trio. We've got esports on one side, we've got hospitality on one side, and I know you also handle part of the women's game too, Noka. We've also got investments, we've got school games, we've got collaborations. I mean, between the three of you, you're doing so much in sports. You're really showcasing the finest um, new opportunities that sport has to offer. I want to start with esports. I mean, it's even an area that I'm not very well acquainted with. You know, one thing I love about sport is it's a bit like law. There's so many different aspects of sport. So when you talk about sport, people tend to specialize. It's rare you find even for me, who is a lawyer, I, I'm predominantly a football lawyer, even though I can do other sides. So sport is similar. There's esports, there's 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 um track, there's track and field, there's swim. So with you, with esports, I love how you're becoming the face of esports in Nigeria. I mean, you've already told us how it started two years ago during lockdown. What 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 inspired you to get into esports? Why esports? Why didn't you stick to conventional sports? Like they say, you haven't finished one thing, or you're already moving somewhere else. <laughs> what was it about esports that, that that said, you know what, I'm gonna get into this? What 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 did you see that we're um, not yet seeing? Um. So so the truth is, um, even though I'm a believer in in the Almighty, so that's that's a factor. And um, I believe in grace. So whatever I've achieved in two years, I must say, even though this is not a spiritual platform, I must say has been grace because I didn't go in to get the appointments. It was just a business move for me. Um, 10 years background in um, 12 now, um, that's 2010, in sports media and marketing. Um, saw business ground to a halt with the lockdown. So there was need for something else because they all need to put food on the table with two daughters and a wife um, so that was very very important and critical to that move and esports was just something that was waiting there another thing i must say is i'm a very restless person so even though i have 15 years at the bar i've never touched a law court <laughs> with my wig and gal after being called uh, i moved on from there to do media from there i moved on to do sports media and marketing which started in 2010. And it's just always about new opportunities. And I looked at it, it's almost like every five year cycle, I'm hoping that with these sports, I won't leave after five years again. <laughs> every five year cycle, I, I tend to make a move um, that changes my course of direction. So that was it for me. And um, esports was just waiting to be to be tapped into, especially in Nigeria, where we had a couple of practitioners before we got into the space and we being the Lagos Esports Forum, and we came in and saw a few loopholes here and there, critical of them being the fact that there were no promotions of what people were doing. So people were doing things, and it was almost like a case of winking in the dark. Nobody sees you doing that. And we came in, I have a media background, uh, the other guys on my team too have you know, a, a, a certain level of, of media experience, and that was critical to how we pushed things. That was also critical. Our marketing background also was critical to how we were able to give value to sponsors because um, we, we are proud to say that 75 to 80 percent of everything we've done, every event, every activation we've done, has a backing by a brand, and 
that was something that was not in the space before we got in. So yes, uh, for me, it was another adventure that was waiting to be tapped. Um, the opportunities that have come afterwards, I would say has been a dint of hard work from me and my team and every other thing that's set to follow from here on. Amazing, honestly. You just, it's, in, it's interesting how passion can, with the right level of structure, because passion alone, I believe, cannot uh, put food on the table. But like you said, um, the right level of curiosity um, and passion, and, and obviously your background as a lawyer must have brought some kind of structure to the table and boom, there you go. Opportunities just start lining up one after the other, you know. So I'm going to come back to you just to We, ask we, have, we have that unusual advantage as lawyers. That's why we say yes, we're learning. Yes, Every other person yes. is educated, but we're learning. Very true. Very true. And I'm now going to move on to Noka just to find out. She's another lawyer, actually, who kind of, you know, decided she wanted to venture more into the amazing world of sports but i would say hospitality i love that about sports do you know you look at miami you look at how they've decided f1 i love how sports puts cities on the map i love how sports has this kind of geographical uh, in, in in ip we call it indication so an area becomes known for a certain type of sport so with you hospitality that's taking you to so many different places in the world um what kind of opportunities would you say you've um, you've enjoyed do you con do you foresee with the kind of work that you do which might inspire some other people on this um call Okay, um, so it's great that you mentioned how um, sports put some cities on the map. Because personally, growing up, sports was sports was like my geography teacher. I know a lot of European cities because of clubs. I know a lot of countries because of the Olympics. I would watch opening ceremonies and be seeing countries I hadn't even heard of before in class. So that's the beauty of sports. It's it's very it opens your mind. It's um, very wide. And like you said, hospitality is a space where I mean, many people wouldn't associate hospitality with sports, but when you think about it, it's one of the driving factors, one of the driving revenues of sports beyond just ticketing, because you need to bring people to experience sports. It's one thing to just say, okay, I'm coming to watch for 19 minutes, I'm watching a football match, I'm watching LeBron James dunk, but how do I experience it just beyond watching players move about? And that's where hospitality comes in especially because it's also a way to then give value to your corporate sponsors. And then you're bringing them, for, you're bringing them maybe to special. So I'll use Miami as an example. Thank God you brought up Miami. Um, so, I mean, there were a lot of controversies with how it was coming to take up the space, how the, uh, Miami Gardens is an underserved, underprivileged area. And they just um, thought that people were just coming to make it all fun fair and nothing for the city. But what we saw last weekend was that Miami was, the, the world, the eyes of the world was on Miami. All the celebrities you could think of were in Miami. All the brands that saw the opportunities and understood the value of sports were in Miami. They necessarily were not associated with F1 before. But because of that, we saw them looking for ways to, there was a Miami, I think, boat club with Mercedes where they had special guests there. Then you also had them using hospitality to sort of um, have like an educational aspect where Lewis Hamilton went to speak to kids about getting into STEM subjects. That was hospitality, but that was sort of using hospitality as a way to bring in community relations. So that's one of the things hospitality gives you. You get to visit and see the city beyond just the stadium. I remember, I think Barcelona was saying how um, the city of Barcelona, that is, over 50% of people that came into Barcelona were coming to see the camp. No, they were coming to see Messi play. So imagine how you have a lot of people coming in each day. For instance, personal experience, I probably wouldn't have gone to Russia if there was no World Cup. But I learned about St. Petersburg. I fell in love with the city, where, whereas if it wasn't football, probably nothing would have taken me there. So it's a way that even here, thinking about it, imagine if maybe the Okweke race, if there was hospitality around it and all that, you have people going to those cities to try and experience the cities more. You would have people be able to travel better and it improves tourism. 
which essentially then goes back to boosting the economy, which is the main opportunity sports presents beyond just the norm. Absolutely awesome. I mean, what you said, yes, I know you went to Russia for the World Cup again. It just, I love how sports just takes you all over the world. I mean, finances permitting, organization permitting, but it just opens your mind, it opens your eyes to all the different, different types of people you can meet, um, different sports, and then the hospitality side, the fact that it brings people, it's another form of tourism. So sport is a facet of tourism. There's religious tourism. People go to, to Mecca, they go to Jerusalem. Sports is a religion for some people and they move wherever that sport is going. So you can imagine what it does to boost the local GDP of, of cities, states. I mean, it's huge. I mean, that was uh, really insightful. So now I want to move to Ade Dami. And I mean, right now you're riding high on the success of the Noga Games. I mean, even in the chat, people are saying, wow, the Noga Games was amazing. We've revived something from the past that kind of went defunct. Again, another opportunity in sports, which we might overlook, which is, is university games. We know that in, in countries like the States, Gosh, the commercials of university games is huge. In fact, so huge that the outcry, um, um, you know, we all know that the athletes, student athletes were formally barred from, you know, having endorsement deals and such. And it, it kind of wasn't making sense commercially because if, if there's more interest in some university games compared with the actual professional leagues, then why on earth would you bar them? So if we've seen how popular university games can be with the drafts, you know, how are we um, um, harnessing that? Tell us a bit more about what you did with the Noga games. And, and this is just the beginning. How can we, how can we make it bigger? Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, um, um, Beverly. Okay, but before I answer, I just want to quickly um, add to what you said and what Naka said too about um, sports and tourism. Um, the only way to drive tourism, to properly drive tourism, is for, is for you to have a calendar of events. So if you're promoting tourism in Lagos, then there has to be a calendar of events where people come to. And sports gives you that. So if you look at your regular sport league, it's a calendar of events for the US. If you look at your premiership or Champions League, it's a calendar of events for um, Europe. So one of the things that we, of, we often um, don't think about is how sport gives you that calendar on which you can build your tourism strategy on. So I just thought to mention that. Um, when it comes to um, university sports, um, it is critical because it plays a number of roles. One is, is the pipeline or it's the um, ladder between developmental sports and professional sports, right? It is, you start developmental sport at the grassroots level, you play in primary school, you play in secondary school, University or um, tertiary institution is where you decide, oh, this is where I begin to go pro. So it is that pipeline that turns you from a regular um, athlete to you want to become a professional athlete. So it does that. And that is one of the things that um, has driven college sports in the US because you have draft days for NFL, you have for NBA, where those professional leagues now go back to colleges to pick the best of talents. And it's a way um, to drive college sports. So it plays a strategic role by bridging that gap between your developmental sports and your professional sports. It does that. Second is um, it gives you an, an audience already because you have students who automatically become fans. You have alumni who automatically become fans. So um, one of the things that is easy for you to, to form an identity with is university you, you, you graduate from. That is why years after people graduate from Harvard, you still see them wear Harvard t-shirts or yield t-shirts because they've built identity with those institutions. And that is what college sports is sitting on. You have a wide range of fans, existing students and alumni. And regardless of ethnicity or where you're from, something connects you. So you have a, a, a fan base which you can build um, that on. And that's one of the things we saw uh, at the Nuga, just concluded Nuga Games. We saw interest from, um, from old students, from alumni. Um, 
who are so one who are so glad that investor of Lagos was hosting, and we're also glad that the um, investor of Ife or investor of Ibadan was participating. So that's the second thing that um, college sports gives you. It gives you a, um, a foundation or fan base that you cannot leverage on. And one of the things we've also um, we've not looked at, you know, in the past is the kind of investment that you can drive into college sports, especially from an infrastructure perspective. Um, if you see pictures from the um, from the football finals of the Nuga Games, we didn't have enough seats for um, the fans, and that was, and this is considering that the school um, also was on strike, and it was a lot we didn't even come in. Um, from within the city, but just for the students on campus alone from the participating university, we didn't have enough space for them. So it gives you an opportunity to say, look, if we drive investment into infrastructure at the college level, there's immediate ROI because again, like I said, it's the um, pathway to professional sports. Um, and it's also, it sits on an existing fan base. Um, now in organizing Nuga games, um, one of the things we learned is that one, um, it's a conscious effort to drive sports in Nigeria. It has to be a conscious effort. Um, so it started from the University of Lagos saying that, look, we want to deliver a Nuga games like never before. You understand? They had that conscious effort in mind to say, look, this is something we want to do. This is something uh, we hope to achieve. And how do we achieve it? So it starts from that. Sports will not develop by happenstance. There has to be a conscious effort and strategy to drive it. And that was the first thing that was present during Nuga Games. The second is, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that, you know, um, Shaya mentioned that lawyers um, always have an advantage and the fact that all you guys are lawyers and everything. Um, I have, I studied engineering in school and I have a um, tax and business advisory um, um, career before transiting into sports. Sports needs more people, more diverse um, expertise for sports to grow. Because I always argue that the people that will develop sports are not the athletes. They are not the core sports people. They are the business people. They are the lawyers. Um, they are the entertainers. Um, those are, you know, the other career path that sport needs. And one thing we did was to, that, that was one of the things we brought into the Nuga Games as Temple. One is we, we deliver entertainment at its best. And we realized that, look, for us to, for, for us to help Unilag like, deliver a memorable you know, um, university games, we have to make sure that there's an experience, not just um, the games, it's an experience itself. And that was one of the things we had in mind when we were um, doing our strategy um, sessions. It was how do we deliver an experience, an unforgettable experience with the Nuga games. And um, like um, was, it was said during the panel before this, there's a, there's a role entertainment plays, and we brought that in full force to the Nuga Games. Um, we had a proper, a world class opening ceremony um, for the Nuga Games, and, as well as closing ceremony. Um, we had an entertainment village, right? And the, the idea behind the entertainment village is after every day and after every game, there has to be a gathering where students can enjoy themselves, they can socialize. Because, like we'll see with, um, with the Super Bowl, after the NFL Super Bowl, people really talk about who played. I can ask all of you that, look, who were the two teams that played the Super Bowl and you won't remember. But if I say who performed at the halftime of Super Bowl, everybody remembers, right? So in creating experience, we need to understand that, look, people might not remember the core sports, but they won't forget the experience they had. So that was one of the things we also thought was very vital in delivering the Nuga games. And we put all of those things together and, you know, um, the, the, all, the third part is when we, when we uh, organize sports and events, we always, most of the time, we do it with, uh, say, I'm organizing an event without considering the fans. So you create events, you know, you're, you're, you're a sports person, in your mind, it looks good. But if you, it, just like in tech, there's a user experience, right? So we need to also bring that in to say, while you're creating this event, how does it, what is the fan experience? What will it be like? And this will affect your timing of the games, your um, venue of the games, sitting arrangement of the games, your social media strategy. All of these things is just to ensure that, look, the fans enjoy it as much as you, the organizers. 
So those are three things we thought about, like one, the conscious efforts from the university to deliver a world-class game. Two is the ingredients we needed to put in to deliver a world-class experience. And the third is putting the fans in mind to also create an experience for the fans and how, um, what needs to be done to ensure that the fans enjoy it as much as we did. And um, from the feedback, I think we did a good job. And you know, what comes to mind with what you're telling me, I'm hearing, making sure the fan this fan engagement the experience is it right to say that i mean in other jurisdictions you even now have an entire sub industry built around just fan engagement whether it's apps that track what fans are talking about these are all subsets of you know that major piece which is how do we get fans to enjoy games better and maybe that ties into esports or at least sports tech. Sports tech is definitely something that we're seeing more and more of, even virtual reality. Again, I know we're a bit disconnected here, but perhaps for the benefit of those that know or for those that want to know more, I, I mean, I haven't ex personally experienced it, but I know that in some stadiums abroad, there's like interaction, you know, there's either sound or there's things you can touch you know the artificial you know artificial um, ar ai vr all these things are helping to enhance um the experience of fans where are we in like what journey how far do we have to go to kind of get to that level or is it more about just adapting to what suits us so maybe no tech but as long as there's some musicians on the stage everything is fine, all is cool, or I just wanted to get a sense of what direction fan engagement should take in Nigeria, because the complaint is we're not engaging the students enough, we're not engaging the young ones enough, we're not engaging the, 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 the older tier enough. So if engagement is the issue, how, like how, what's, what's the, 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 the solution to that? And I want Adedami to answer before I move back to Shayo. Um, okay, um, thanks, Bobby. Um, so if you look at fan experience, right, um, look at it as, say, customer experience. Let me put it that way. We say fan engagement because we think about it from a sports perspective. But for you to properly understand what the implication of fan experience, imagine what customer experience is for a regular um, organization. They take it seriously because they know that, look, customer experience in a way ties directly to revenue, right? So for you to think about fan engagement, you need to, first of all, recognize the importance of fans to your business. Now, for you to do that, then you need to see sports as a business, which is the starting point, right? It is not perceived as a business, because most of the owners of the sports properties, the sports clubs, the sport leagues, they're not commercial vehicles. They're not commercial assets. They're more um, state-owned political tools. So nobody takes fans seriously. And an example is, because um, I follow basketball a lot in Nigeria, basketball games are scheduled for 2 p.m. on a Tuesday, right? And the question is, for who? You understand? So. For you to take, for you to even think in the direction of fan engagement or fan experience, you need to value your fans. And there's no incentive for you to value your fans if you're not saying, if you don't tie directly to your um, commercial drive. So if there's no commercial, if, if professional sports in Nigeria is not commercially driven, fan engagement is dead. Right. So because it, now from, from let, let me take it, let me make an example of the Nuga games, right? Because we had sponsors that we had to deliver value to, you understand? We had sponsors that came on board and we said, look, um, come on board because there'll be this amount of students, there'll be this amount of activities. We, there was a conscious effort to ensure that you know, there's fan engagement so that the brand can get value, right? Which, is, you know, which it brings me back to the point that, look, if there's something that ties to your commercial um, success, as a sports property, then you take fan engagement seriously. And in regions where they understand this, they are beginning to ask themselves, okay, how do we ensure that um, it is easy for fans to buy tickets, which is where technology comes in. Tickets in, 
right? Because again, you want to enrich, you want to make it as easy as possible for fans to give you their money. That's the bottom line of it, right? So you're making ticketing as easy, as straightforward as possible using technology. You are making sure that as soon as they get into um, the stadium, it is easy for them to clock in to navigate I've stood at um, Agege Stadium for hours just to try to buy tickets, right? And the question is, why am I stressing myself, right? The person I want to give the money to doesn't really care anyways. So, you know, you, you begin to see how these things come in if we think about it from, from a commercial mindset, right? So you want fans to buy tickets easily. You want them to get access to the venues easily. You want the seats to be comfortable. And as, as simple as this sounds, you go to a lot of stadiums in the country and you can't properly sit. You want the restrooms to be comfortable. So there's something I tell people that look, um, statistics show that look, um, for every household, the, the, the mother or um, the, the woman is, she controls 80% of the entertainment spend. So anywhere she can't go comfortably, anywhere she can't take the kids to comfortably, she's not spending money there. Right. So the question is, if you look at it from the perspective, which of our facilities in Nigeria is conducive for women and children to go to? Right. Something as basic as restroom. So you begin to see how all of this ties into fan experience and fan engagement. Right. Because if you don't give them that experience, you can't even engage them at all. So the first thing which I think is the foundation is for us to look at sport from a commercial perspective. When you know there is need to generate revenue, you begin to understand the importance of the fans. And when you see fans as your customers and your, as your consumers, then you ensure that you um, provide optimum experience for them and you engage them in the proper way. And this could be as simple as sharing um, information or sharing your schedule of events. Because there are also sporting events that we hold in Nigeria and you find information about it, you won't get it. So the foundation of fan engagement, fan experience is the commercialization of professional sport. Nice, nice. Shayo, coming to you now with everything that Adidami is talking about, fan engagement, fan experience, esports. What advantage does esports have right now? Like, would you say there's appeal off the bat? Is there appeal, mass appeal for esports? Is it a Gen Z thing? Is it a millennial thing? Um, how is esports different to conventional sports in terms of the use, um, engagement, and even financial opportunities? Because, hey, I, me, I heard that with esports, kids as young as 13 are playing games and they're making like $2,000 and all that. So is that a myth? Is it like, tell us, what's this, the deal with esports? Um, so, yes, um, it's, it's all happening. And it's it's amazing when you hear um, some of these things. And um, if you don't mind, I'd just like to chip into what um, Adidami said, which were all fantastic. But we also need to move from the point of physical fan experience, which was what you mentioned, to the tech side of it, the digital side of it. Because you discover that most of the times, the kind of experience we create in Nigeria with events, uh, sporting events, is usually for those who are there. We need to now start creating smart experiences where those who are there would have a platform where they can relate with those who are not there. And that comes from the organizers building social collateral. That comes from food utilization of social media platforms. Um, that comes from, you know, tech platforms. Like you said, there are tech platforms. There was a, at the time when we got into eSports, someone reached out to me from SA talking about Oh, how can we do fan engagement with? And I and I totally turned it down. That was 2020, just two years ago. I said it can't work here just yet because we were not there. And that was the sincere truth. I would only be deceiving such a person to oh, bring money. Let's put in this kind of funds. Yes, we may start to build it, which was what we eventually resorted to. But we're not there yet in terms of creating smart experiences that involves those who are live there and those who are, you know, not um, at, at the venue. And uh, so as regards eSports, I think the thing about eSports is it, it has everything that sports has. It's only just the electronic side of it. Because the truth is we, we, we're seeing gamers being signed up by football clubs in England to play with their jerseys for them. And we're seeing transfers happening 
in 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 esports. So everything is there. We're seeing esports education evolving the world the over. How does that yes. work? How does it transfer? Same way it works. Same way it works. We, we're seeing so a team in Germany can say, "Oh, I want this guy to play for us," Amazing. or even within the same league, the Premier League top top on the list of that where players are getting transferred to to play and 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 you're seeing figures being you know exchanged and players are getting salaries there are clubhouses where players stay you know and and grow and on their skills and improve their talent so everything about esports yeah everything about sports is in esports the question is how well are we uh, tapping into it here because the opportunities are boundless, but it is only the work that we need to do to put in to get to that level. And the first point of call, which we're still missing, is the education. Esports education, just as the same way we're missing it with sports education, because there's really no sports education. All we have is PhD. Where do you learn sports management? Where do you learn sports marketing? Where do you learn? Well, sports nutrition seems to be gathering some, some momentum. But there are so many other facets to sports that are still missing. So the same thing is happening with esports. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday, and, and this comes to parents and their kids, where we're talking about, oh, you were, you were saying, oh, I want my kids to concentrate on their school because most of the time they're on the phone playing games. And I must say, mobile games even have more traction in Africa because of the challenges with consoles and access to the digital platforms. Mobile gaming has more traction than console gaming and PC gaming because most kids can afford it, but an average kid has a smartphone which he can use to play mobile games. And mobile gamers are also beginning to win big bucks in terms of prize money. It's only down to how we regulate it. So back to what I was saying, he said that, and I reminded him and said, that was the same way probably an Adidami who wanted to play football in the 80s was not allowed to play by his parents. I fall into that category. I remember I still look at my yearbook and what I feel in my yearbook was lawyer and footballer. What do you want to be in future? Lawyer, footballer. But the truth is, after doing five years in law, one year in law school, there was nowhere I would go back and play football at in mid-20s. <laughs> because time was far gone. What was I going to start at under 17? You know, so those are the many challenges we're having with esports. It's the same thing. It's almost like, a 20, backtracking 20 years to where sports was, but we're putting in the work. Uh, 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 my team and so many other people, we only need to understand that we should build for sustainability, not just for the immediate. Most of the times when we build things and most spot properties in Africa, it's usually for immediate. We call it racket. It should not be about a racket mindset. It should be about sustainability. So with what has been done with Nuga now, we expect the bar not to come down from there. It should go up and keep going up. Whether it is tempo, because another thing is, you usually understand the dynamics of Nigerian sports is when the administrator changes or when this thing changes, we go back to ground zero. So we need that to get to that point where we know that this is a standard, this is a bar that's been raised and we need to keep raising the bar in spite and despite of anyone who sits in that seat to control that particular sports property. The same thing is happening with the esports. I'm glad we are associated with the Global Esports Federation. As I mentioned, we have the Global Esports Games, which is happening every year, started last year. We're going to Istanbul this year. This year, we're also, the Commonwealth Games has opened itself up, first for a demonstration sport in uh, 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 Birmingham in August. And we expect that that opportunity and that story we're able to curate from the two gamers we're looking to take to that experience would open the minds of so many other young people here to say, this is possible. I can achieve this and we can build from there. Mm, nice. Opening the minds, inspiring. I mean, I want to come to uh, Ojanoka now. In the kind of work that you do, I, I, I don't. let me not take this from a gender perspective. Let's just take this generally. Why don't we have enough specialized sports, tourism, and hospitality professionals like yourselves, just as a starting point? You know, why, what, what, why, why is it? Because lack of expertise is also kind of holding us back. We don't have enough. Someone, I can't remember if it was Shayo or Adedami that alluded to that. When you don't have, maybe it was in the previous session, when you don't have enough of the right experts, people in leadership, then it kind of 
does it holds back the, the the growth you know so for you someone like yourself i mean there's very few of you that's why you know you stand out so much um you, you want to be in an industry where there's many of you not few it doesn't really pay in the long run to just be one of the few so what 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 are your thoughts on how to grow this industry this subsector that you're in and you know where what is even the few what what, what how would you compare the local environment for um, sports tourism and hospitality with um with uh, abroad like what are the major differences you know because i always say i know what my mates in sports law are doing abroad they've gone far <laughs> <laughs> you know so just not wanting to compare but to make us feel gloomy but more of what's the challenge for us in terms of where are we going with your subsector okay um so i love that um i did i mean mentioned that first of all we need to understand that sports is a business I um, think that's one of the things we are missing. Fine, it's growing. There started to be a sports industry, but we still need to understand that sports needs to generate revenue. There needs to be commercialization. And before we even go to hospitality, like Danny has mentioned, we need to understand experience. What is the experience you are giving the fans? The fans are important stakeholders. Whether or not they are in the stadium or like abroad, there are some fans they call, they're like TV, they're couch fans. Meaning those fans who sit down all day on Saturday, watch all the Premier League games, they only stand up to eat and come back. Mm -hmm. How are you catering to those fans? They don't necessarily need to be in the stadium. Another thing is sort of understanding that you need to understand the sports space because, and I believe this is something that in Nigeria, we're still a bit struggling with this. It's like the sports industry, the sports community and it's, is in its own bubble. They're just in the sports community. How are you interacting with private brands, for instance? How are you interacting with people that are not sports lovers? Do I need to love sports to go to a gay stadium? What is in it for me? So if I use hospitality as an example, a lot of people that are in hospitality spaces in global sports events don't like sports. Many of them are there for the networking experience, they are there to just have a VIP lifestyle experience. Oh, I watch Messi play live. I happen to be yeah. in the same room where Infantino was in the next room. It's those little things. So before we even think of hospitality, I don't want, like you said, not to make it gloomy, but we need to understand the foundation of sports. And I believe it was mentioned in the session before that. How do you commercialize? And I think Bemi Abudu was saying how um, there are no superstars in our sports space. What's bringing me to watch? If I'm coming to watch um, Aimba, who is drawing me? Do I need to be in the sports space to know this player? What's outside of sports, outside of football? Who is he? What does he do? Aimba, how many following do they? Like, Jigger, what's their following? Why should I watch Aimba? What are their brand colors? Things like that make you, I mean, for instance, if I use an example, um, so, and I think Adidas and Nike now to get women involved more in sports. So they are trying to sell merchandise, but they are not doing it the traditional way. So they are making jersey dresses. They are yes. making they are making jerseys with polka dots. These are things to attract women. It doesn't mean it has to be this woman has to love sports, but she can love fashion. It can bring yes. her into the stadium. These are the little ways we need to understand in Nigeria. I mean, Adedami made a very, very important point, which I love that. How do women and children feel safe? That's the first thing globally. Sports is a family-oriented space. It's a safe space. You need to be able to allow everyone feel inclusive in a sports space. It's not necessarily about, oh, you're coming to watch um, football in a gay game. You're coming to National Stadium to watch a basketball match. I might not be interested or I might not even have the attention span for 90 minutes, but what will give me that experience? What will make me feel special? What are the moments that I can take from that? We've mentioned the Super Bowl here. We've mentioned F1 Miami Grand Prix. I mean, when they were doing the grid work on the F1, there were a lot of people that didn't even know who the drivers were. True. But they were there. <laughs> their, money, their money is being put back into F1. Their money is being put back into the team. 
is being put back on. Sorry to interrupt, but that point you made about we need our own sports stars. I remember watching Pharrell and the BBC guy went over to him and said, oh, so who's your money on? And he said, look, I'm just here to support my brother, okay? Yeah. And we all know his bro the brother he's referring to is Lewis Hamilton. He probably yeah. doesn't know, sorry, uh, Pharrell, but who the, the drivers are. He's like, exactly. he's my brother. I'm just supporting my brother. So do we have enough of that brother culture, that uh, or sister, that superstar that can connect so what you raise exactly is so family. yeah it needs to get so when we understand all this before we think of hospitality because from a personal experience hospitality at the nigeria qualifiers not to call out anybody but the world cup qualifiers at tesla it wasn't hospitality it really no. was just red chairs to separate and the vip that's not an experience no and then so for instance how do you get the tony Lumelus, the dango taste to come and watch a match we need to start thinking that way. But in order to even get to them, you need to start with the fans that, how do they, because they then translate to how you can use that to then create experiences for other people that are not sports fans. I mean, Shia also mentioned how we limit ourselves to how do we cater to fans just in the stadium. So for instance, NBA, there's NBA League Pass. There are some people that don't go to watch um, NBA matches physically. But NBA League Pass is just their way to experience. And NBA League is starting to dabble into things of like, you can pick a certain player camera, you can pick certain locker rooms to be in on when the coach is talking to them. Those are experiences. So even with hospitality, you don't limit to just in stadium. Hospitality can also be, I, I saw that I think um, what some NFL leagues are thinking of doing is they're trying to use NFTs for season tickets. Yeah. And to say that when you're a season ticket holder with those digital assets, you then have special um, benefits. So that's their own hospitality. Okay. It's not in stadium, but it means you can be in your bed, but you can listen in to when maybe Russell Wilson and his team, ODB, are all in on their player circle. Yes. Or you can actually pick certain areas of the stadium you want to look at. Yeah. Those are experiences we need to think of beyond. So in terms of Nigeria now, I would say, like Shia said, he rejected someone that came two years ago. Not to be gloomy, but I would say before we even think to corporate hospitality, let's think of creating fun experience. Let's think of creating fun Yes. Oh, and just I wanted to mention one thing too before I move to Shia. Isn't it interesting how Puma have started this activation with, um, what's his name? David O. David O. They're suddenly yeah. opening, I don't know if there was a Puma store already, but you know, they've got David O meet and greet. There was a meet and greet with David O, I think last weekend in Abuja. And suddenly people who didn't even like Puma are picking up, okay, let me just take, if I can afford this small bracelet, I'll buy it. But by the time 10 or 20 people buy that small bracelet, 20 people buy the shoes, maybe two people buy the Puma jersey, you've now got that traction yeah. with um, with spending. Shio, over to you. Yeah, so just wanted to add fantastic points by Noka. Um, the first challenge we have is the fact that we there's so much focus on administrators. The administrators are the spot stars on this side of the climb, while it should be the, the, the main guys on the pitch, on the courts and the pool, wherever they are. And that's that's one mindset we need to shift, even for the guys in the media. You see them running after the administrators rather than run after that guy who just, it's a record or it's close to, you know, the next big thing. And it's, I think I should trickle it down even to the, uh, 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 to, to Noga a bit, and say that for Adedami and the team, where are those top 10, top five performers from Noga? We should celebrate those guys and see where they go from here. Because another thing is we, we finish this tournament and everyone just goes on and we're cool, Quiet. we're happy. Quiet. It's time to put them on the, I know Shiyo Lofi Jano started with Noga and today is a big star in world football ah. playing it he played in the premier league and all that yes he was with loud tech uh and 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 he played in nuga went on to play for the super eagles played at the world cup so those guys those are the kind of stories just as i mentioned earlier on we need to create stories around that small beginning 
Because it's that small beginning that gives mm -hmm. that little child in Otupo, another one in Sapele, mm -hmm. in Ogomosho, uh, an understanding of the possibility that lies ahead of them if and when they get that chance on that court, on that pitch, and, and the opportunity. And also to add to the influencer marketing thing, I think uh, Puma took a cue from Nike when they did that thing with uh, uh, the whiskey with the Nigerian jersey. Oh. So it's... It's just smart marketing. And that's, yes. that's another thing. We may not have the stars, but there are influencers who can actually still direct people yes. to the sports platforms, the sports pitches, the, the fields and the, and the events. And it will be a win-win solution for everyone. So the question I have, I mean, based on what you've all said, is it time for sports, the sports industry to, okay, so we have the specialists, like you guys are all clearly specialists, but one thing I, I personally noticed is the sports industry is so tight. Like for me, I'm hearing fan experience, fan engagement. That tells me that I might want to work with say events, maybe specialized events planners, you know, like abroad you have events planners that only work in certain industries not like the wedding like how you have wedding planners all they do wedding are planners. weddings we should be at the stage where we're having specialized sports events planners so you, there's not this case of bombardment you know a, a business shouldn't have to worry about okay um i need to sort out the players i need to sort out the hospitality we can begin to outsource some of these um areas to to these specialized companies so i mean i'm just trying to since this panel is about opportunities in sport perhaps in nigeria we should begin to see sports and entertain i think there's entertainment planners to be fair with you but let's see more of the sports event planners who understand the peculiarities of sport they know the types of nuances that fans like to see they can set up uh, all these elaborate spaces you walk in and you feel like oh wow this is a recreation of wembley this is a recreation of i don't know just because that's what i'm hearing i'm hearing more and more that we need to create more subsectors in sport it's not enough to just say oh i run a sports business are you as a sports businessman working with event planners are you working with like the likes of noka and her company to deliver uh, sports tourist packages rather than that diy i feel like sport has a bit of a diy attitude i might be wrong we want to do everything ourselves but other industries tend to work with other um, specialists and other, I don't know if that's making any sense to you guys. Yeah, it is. I can just so quickly um, talk about this from experience. Um, I think it was about three weeks ago, we actually, at Integra, we organized um, a, viewing, a match viewing experience for Arsenal and one of their sponsors in Nigeria. And exactly what you're saying about having specific event planners. So. We tried, so we walked with an event planner, but we then saw that because they are not specialized in sports, we had to almost be doing everything in our capacity as understanding events and activation. So for instance, and I'll just give you, I won't even mention the name of the, but we had an artist and you're coming for an Arsenal event and the artist is wearing a Liverpool jersey. Oh my so goodness. You like, oh, this can happen. So you understand there are nuances to sports that we need to understand. Meaning even the event planner needs to sort of understand some IP issues in sports. Yes. Because there's no way an Arsenal sponsor is and you're coming on stage with a Liverpool jersey. Those little uh -huh. things. Or you uh -huh. cannot be having Man City's shade of blue in a Man U event. You understand those little nuances. So. It's good what you're saying about specialization, but it needs to be by people that are intentional. Because like you're saying, I think um, there's a DIY attitude to sports. Even as a sports lawyer, and I don't know if you've come across this, but I have people, I have other lawyers across the table that are generalists, but they don't do anything in sports. And I'm having to explain things that, if you are in the sports space, should be easy. Yes. So I think we need to be intentional about our sports industry, understanding yes. the sports business. It's not just, oh, I want to make money. Arsenal is coming, let me go. So it needs yes. to be people like everybody here on this panel is intentional about being in this space. It's not in that- In a way, in a certain job. way. Exactly. Yes. It's not a thing of, we didn't find another job. Let's just stick to sports. I mean, there's, so I think there needs to be some intentionality there. 
about people coming into the industry and the industry itself needs to have a structure. So when people come in, it's easy to be able to phase out the people that we know do not know what they're doing there and not necessarily just focusing on administrators, even from the lower parts, from journalists. Are you a journalist that really wants to be passionate about sports? Do you care about athletes or did you not get into one other industry? I'm like, let me just write on NPFL this week. No. So I think those are the things that we need to be intentional about. Mm, spot on, spot on. Adedami, do you have anything, do you have any take on that? Okay, uh, yeah, yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, so I, I wanted to actually comment on what Shaya said about administrators and, you know, what Naka said on Superstar. But I'll come to that after this. Uh, I think that what would, have, what, would, what, what would happen is the demand for those skills will drive um, um, those, those industries or those um, smaller businesses. Because, uh, Beverly, you, you mentioned that we, we need to, you know, create this, but those things won't happen unless there's a demand for it. I'll give you an example. Um, while we were planning the opening ceremony uh, of the Nuga Games, we had to employ or engage a creative director to create the opening ceremony, mm -hmm. right? We had to engage um, someone to design the stage for the opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. We bought lights, uh, we engaged a sound person. Mm -hmm. The opening mm -hmm. ceremony itself, we, I know the amount of um, vendors that we worked with to deliver the opening um, ceremony. These are, not your regular, these are not your regular guys that do sports, right? Yes. But the fact that there was an opening ceremony created the opportunity for them to be a part of it. Exactly. So the more opening ceremonies we have, the more people begin to say, you know what, I can actually specialize in designing stages for sports ceremonies. That will drive that. In the session before this, uh, Ms. Nkechi mentioned that there are about 20,000 players in the NLO, uh, at the NLO, which is the third tier. Now, if we were in a situation where those guys earn a, um, a certain amount of money and they know they are and they, they are entitled to kind of bonuses, they have opportunities to get some kind of an endorsement. They'll see the need to get the, um, the lawyer to look at the agreement first before they sign. Exactly. 20,000 players needing lawyers would mean that, look, there is a demand for sport. Run lawyers. out of work, that's for sure. Yeah, you understand? <laughs> so the moment we see that, look, there's a demand for these services, services would emerge. And, and a good example is telecoms. If we didn't have GSM line senses that created the likes of the MTN and we wouldn't have slots and the guys are fixed phones at Computer Village. Those jobs didn't exist until um, telecom industry um, was um, revamped and we had GSM line senses and we had the likes of Blue and MTN. So the moment you have demand for services, people would come up with those skills. It, is, it becomes easy to specialize yes. in those skills. We understand. And if you look at the sports industry, and that's why we're arguing with policy that the industry can um, deliver millions of jobs because it is multifaceted. The kind of jobs that the industry can create, it goes beyond um, law, it goes beyond... You know, I, I know organizations, who, all they do is design sports infrastructure. HKS is one of it, Populous is one of it. They, that, that's what they do as their businesses. If we have to build a hundred new stadiums in the country, then there's a need for people to design those stadiums. Yes. And the moment that happens, you become to see people that say, look, I've been doing architect and I've been doing buildings for a couple of years. I want to go into sports properties now. I want to design sport arenas. That yes. would happen. And the only way we can drive the demand for these services again is if we commercialize professional sports. Because if you look at com countries where they have these kind of services or specialized services. The people they service are the professional sports, the NBAs, the NFLs, the MLS, the EPLs. They are professional sports. They really do it for developmental sports. And you know, that's mm -hmm. why, and back to the comment I made that we focus too much on administrators is because we don't have any other option. <laughs> the moment you separate um, sport development and amateur sport and national team right. from the professional side, and we see the professional side as being commercial and commercially driven and is a business. The focus automatically shifts because now we're running as a business. We know the things we need to do. 
Chelsea has been in the news for the past six, um, three weeks or four weeks. And the conversation has been about um, transfer of ownership, who are the new buyers, who are the new investors. Nobody has said anything about the um, EPL chairman or the FA chairman. Yeah. It has been solely on the club. And that is because, look, there's a the business side of it, which should run as a business, and there's the development side of it and the national side of it, which also run as that. So the moment we have that separation and we commercialize professional sports fully, it will drive demand in all of these things mm. that we want to see happen. Then it will make people shift focus from um, the administra administrators to the professional clubs, because the professional clubs will now start acting as professional clubs. And it brings me back to the um, comment you can make about um, superstars. Look, there, is an there has to be an incubator for superstars, right? There has to be something that takes you from being an, a talent to a star. Mm -hmm. And I give the example of Big Brother Nigeria. You go into that house as a regular person and you come back out as a star because there's an incubator for it, which is what we need. And the moment, again, professional sport becomes a proper business, superstar stardom starts from things as basic as releasing information Right, yes. because if you support a club and you know who your starting eleven is, we know you who your um, reserves are, you know their first name, their full name, what they do, where they are from. You can get that information from the club. That is yes. the very fund basis of um, superstardom. So that is one information is sorted. Next is is the experience. Now it becomes easy for you to go watch a game, and you already know the names of these eleven guys. Then you remember the guy that scored two goals. And that is where fandom starts because now you can relate to them properly. It's okay, fine. The next time I'm going to watch this game, I want to look out for this person. The next time you see the person at the store, I want to look out for this. I want to take a picture with this person. So those are the things. They are building blocks for superstardom. And again, the very foundation of that is uh, commercializing professional sport. Because again, if you think about it, how many amateur star um, talent all over the world are superstars no no what brings them into limelight is professional sports regardless of the age right True. at tennis for example um the young girl coco yes. she became a star because she joined the wta and she started playing in the wta tour and she and and, and um and the grand slam so it is not developmental sport or amateur sport that will turn you into a star it's professional sport professional and also sport. it is run commercially and it's as run as a business, the building blocks will not be put in place for them to now go from being talent to being um, to being stars. So it all comes back to again that look, the future of sports in Nigeria and the sports industry is first our separation of developmental sports and professional sports and the commercialization of that professional sports. Professional sports. Once that happens, it will trigger hospitality. It will trigger. Um, tourism, it will trigger technology, it will trigger esports, it will trigger demand for all of these sub services because again, we begin to see it as a business that it is. And the interesting part is once that happens, it makes it easy for us to now reverse pump money into development of sports for two reasons. One is you make enough money off professional sports. I'll give you an example if you read the um, EFL reports for 2020 2021. The, the Premier League, the 20 clubs in the Premier League paid as much as 3.9 billion in taxes to the UK government. Wow. Taxes wow. only. This is um, not what they do with their EFL, uh, EPL foundation in terms of um, development and grassroots, in terms of developing um, the other tiers of football. This is just taxes. So if the UK government decides to spend 2 billion out of the 2.3.9, on grassroots football, it's a huge amount of money. They are still at net 1.9, right? So that is there. Um, what the NBA is doing with NBA cares and uh, basketball without borders across the world is because they have an NBA that generates eight, $8 billion in revenue every year, mm -hmm. right? What you do, what you see with ITF is because again, they have WTA and ATP that pretty brands that fund the activities of the ITF. So when you commercialize professional sports, you get revenue that can plow back into developmental sports. And beyond that, you begin to sell dreams to the guys in um, the amateur guys that look, I have someone now I'm looking up to. If I know there's an Ahmed Musa that plays for Canopy that has this amount of money that is this rich, this influential, there's someone I'm aspiring to, it becomes aspirational. Mm. And that is why there's a movie called uh, uh, Like Mike, 
right? I want to become like yes. like, uh, like like my daughter because those people now begin to see these stars as their idols. They want to be like. So it becomes a no-brainer to sell sports to parents anymore because they already see what the kids can look like. So the foundation, the, what we need to do to develop sports and achieve all of these things is to separate amateur sports from professional sports from professional and to sports. commercialize professional sports. Once that is set, they'll be fine. Hmm. That's, that, that was quite... I, I really liked how you built that up. I really like that. That incubation is critical and something that the entertainment industry does so well. But again, like you said, Noka, I think intentionality is critical. We need to be intentional about the way we're running our sports businesses, just like any other business. I have just a couple of questions I want to take from the chat before we go to closing comments this is from game head sports and the question is directed at adedami was esports <laughs> so maybe it's directed at shayo and adedami a potential collabo was esports part of the just concluded nuga games and what plans does nuga have to activate esports into universities so i guess this is a double question adedami and then shayo um, so it wasn't, it wasn't because there are, there are about 17 sports codes um, under the Nuga Games, um, athletics, basketball, badminton, and, and the like. So it wasn't a part of the just concluded Nuga Games. But I, I know that before, prior to the Nuga Games, Nuga had some form of um, a partnership with Gema, which is an esports platform to drive um, um, esports in school. And they had a tournament in the University of Lagos. And I know that the long term plan is to ultimately include esports as part of the uh, NUGA code. So I, I think we'll see some uh, more collaborative efforts happen before 2014 um, Unijos um, NUGA Games, but it wasn't a part of the 2022 um, Unila Games because it's not a sports code, yes, but I know that um, NUGA is an association that started most, you know, um, forging collaborations and, and partnerships um, to include esport as part of their sporting code. Okay. Uh, Shaya, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> um, yeah, I would, would look forward to what that birth. Um, interestingly, we were in talks with Nuga before Gamer, but the terms were not right. And um, we had to back out of that uh, partnership. Uh, that's the Lagos Esports Forum. So we'll, we'll look forward to what would be perfect from there. We're ready to assist in whatever way we can, uh, but it's important that they get it right. One of the things we thought could have been achieved with um, this particular games, which is how esports is finding its way into sports tournament is to have done maybe a demonstration on one side or to probably have had it at the games village, which, is, which was going to be informal. So people would have played one merchandise and you know all that so that it gets into the consciousness of the student but well, like i said we wait to see what happens with uh, 2024 in um, unijos nice. and it's also a good thing that says that thinking in that direction mm -hmm. so i mean that, that's that's yeah. a good starting point. that's a starting point Definitely. i've got a question from monsura she says how can we translate nuga into secondary school sports sports is about starting young um okay um so yes it it is now the how I put that is the more we develop um, college sports, right? Get the right uh, properly package those tournaments like we did for Mini Lab 2022. The more popular or revamped the game is, the more universities see they need to get the right amount of talent into right. their sports, right. right? Because for the NCCA, for example. They know that, look, as a Duke University or University of Connecticut, um, I know what my collegiate football team or basketball team, I know what it does for um, for me getting the right um, um, endowment from alumni, for me getting the right um, students into my university. So the moment you are able to revamp the co um, collegiate sports, you know, starting with NUGA, and investors begin to see the need to um, get the right and the best athletes into their sporting teams. We we'll begin to see things like um, athlete scholarships and all of those things. And the moment we have that, then it automatically trickles down to secondary school because you know that look, if you can't afford to go to university, sports will give you an opportunity. So just exactly. play sports, you get a student scholarship, 
to pay for probably Unilag or Uniben, then that automatically drives secondary school sport because now they have something they are aiming at. Um, if yes. I'm good enough, right, um, I'll get in, I'll get scholarship into university. And if you look at this, the sports um, scene, Milo has done wonderfully well with ba um, secondary school basketball over the years. I think uh, Milo secondary school basketball is still one of the most popular secondary school games, as well as the principals cup from the football side. Football what side. it's missing is how to now take those talents right from secondary schools into the university system and the, what the reason why that this disconnect is there is because we don't have you know universities who see the need and are looking at you know the right talent and the best talents from these secondary school games and again because you know tertiary sports or college sport or university sport hasn't been positioned well enough for investors to see the benefits but the moment we reposition that and universities begin to see um, the commercial benefits or the social benefits with um, winning games like Nuga or um, having the best um, university teams and they, they, they see the commercial rewards probably in form of sponsorship or in, in terms of donation from alumni or in terms of revenue, I mean um, merchandise and all of those things, then they will see the need to get the best talent and when there's now, where they, when there's a demand for talent, you, off, you start to offer incentives in form of scholarship, in, term, in form of free uh, accommodation, probably mm -hmm. a stipend, just to get the right talent mm -hmm. from those secondary school games into your university. So I, I think largely the, the secondary school games, uh, they're doing well, is just to provide that uh, incentive for investors to now piggyback into those um, competitions to get the best talent and to now give them incentive to attend their universities. So, and I think we've started that with the Nuga Games. Um, hopefully it is sustained uh, at, at the Unijos Games in 2024 and, and beyond. And also beyond Nuga Games, because Nuga is just for universities. We also hope this is um, replicated at the Polytechnic level because there's Nipogatsu yes. for Polytechnic, there's Natsega for um, Technical and College of, College of Education. Um, so the moment you have that um, replicated across all then it drives demand for talent at the secondary school level. Nice. And Shio, what you have something you want to say? Yeah, I wanted to just add that um, also beyond that, because like we've mentioned, we all mentioned it earlier on, um, there's a need to take them beyond that Nuga games. Because Nuga games is gone now. What's next for those guys? Are they back to the classroom? What are the things they're using to earn their skills? And what's the next challenge for them? We have the National Sports Festival coming up. So it still goes back to the custodians of these are sports. Um, how many scouts were there from sports ministries at the state level to see which talents would be part of? Because the, the um, sports festival is just less than six months away or thereabout, you know. And these are talents that we should be looking to bring into the fold. Uh, 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 so that they can actually access that national level because that would be a good conduit, that would be a good incubator, just as Adidami mentioned earlier on, for them to begin to build that reputation and that star uh, status that we're looking at. So there's a need for, and, and someone has been mentioning a lot about um, secondary schools, you know, we have the National School Sports Federation. There's so many federations, yes, one is there, they all need to bring their A game on because talents are bound all over the country. Yeah. Competitions bring them out, but how do we then build them up? Yeah. It's the biggest question. And, and, and that's, that's where we get to lose so many talents. And we see ourselves going to look for uh, talents from abroad when we have so many here to, to mm. harness. Gosh, and that's that's actually quite a good place to leave it because honestly, there's so many people here, but we're not making the best of what we have. I think that kind of really sums up these issues. The opportunities are all around, but we need the midwives, like Miss Nkechiobi said, to help make the connections, you know? Sometimes we see, but we don't see, like how Shio spotted eSports opportunity in COVID time, you know, and Adedami helping to revive Noga and Noka, you know, her active work in hospitality. She's also taking people to, to what is it, Qatar? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you're interested in going. So there's so many opportunities in sport. It's boundless. And I believe for us in this 
in the audience, we should be looking at how can we plug in, right? For me, my, my ears were going off with events. There should be people right now thinking about setting up specialist sports and maybe entertainment events companies that understand the nuances of, of sports. Just the same way the wedding industry has boomed to literally a billion Naira industry, I don't see why we can't replicate the same in, um, in sports and entertainment. These are things that we do almost on a weekly basis. I mean, it, we could go on and on, but unfortunately we've got limited, we've actually overrun, but because this was the last session, I kind of, you know, um, wasn't, I wasn't too uh, uh, strict, but you know, I have to respect your time. It's been such an amazing panel, very engaging, very, um, very insightful commentary that I think will add value to, to the knowledge of the people in the audience. I hope people in the audience will feel inspired maybe to, to, to start new businesses or add additional services or, you know, just um, maybe even collaborate. I think we've talked about how much collaboration is needed in the sporting industry and we shouldn't have this DIY attitude to wanting to do everything ourselves. We should be able to reach out, oh Shio, I really want to get esports into my school. I could be a school owner. And I could decide I want to put esports in my school, or I could be, you know, taking some people away for my 40th birthday, and I want to reach out to Noka because she knows all the good places in the world where we can take place and uh, people for sports uh, tourism. And Adedami, I mean, if you're looking to um, um, develop talent at the tertiary level and you've got someone in a university here and they're they're just lost they don't know what to do you can reach out to each and every one of these people i've dropped their um social media accounts you need to follow them engage them connect with them you know this summit is not just to listen it's to take in and act like um, i believe it was um Bimi sola's parting comments we all have a uh, we all have a role to play in moving this industry forward. It's not the role of government alone. It's not the role of private sector alone. It's 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 like each and every one of us. So I really hope you took something away. Um, the session has wrapped up for today. Please, if you haven't yet um, um, participated in the giveaway. Make sure you do. No count one, one of the vouchers yesterday. <laughs> so if you haven't yet participated, please, please follow AFA Sports and drop that comment. Hashtag AFA little x o a l for a chance to win some really cool gear. I have some of their gear. I can tell you it's really cool. And it's made in Nigeria and it's probably Nigerian. We don't need to be wearing Puma. Yes, we can wear Afa. We can wear Hagai. We can wear all these other brands. So thank you so much. Please go into the dashboard, drop your comments. Um, you know, just let's engage and Hopefully I'll see most of you tomorrow. We're starting at 10. We'll be a bit earlier and all these little issues we had today. I really apologize. So a massive thank you to Noka, to Shayo and Adedami. You guys were brilliant. So insightful. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all tomorrow. And please comment, talk about the summit. Let's get more people um, in tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Beverly. You. Yeah, That's thank my you staff. <laughs>